Today it's stage two on our Street Strip 347 Small Block Ford. Let's see what more compression, induction, and RPM can do. Engine power is back with the familiar and surprisingly potent little small block Ford we dubbed Little Black and Blue. Now its parts recipe was chosen using sound engine logic and part selection. Now it laid down some pretty good numbers on the dyno for such a small package on pump gas. And today it graduates to stage two where we expect to pull even more power out of it. Now here's a quick look at how it went together and performed on the dyno last time. We started with a Summit Racing fully machined and prepped late model OEM block. Then added off the shelf parts like an Eagle ESP Armor forged crank, H beam rods, and Mala pistons. A Lunati hydraulic roller cam controlled all their valve train. A Moroso 7 quart front sump pan sealed up the bottom end, and up top, a set of Airflow Research 205cc Renegade cylinder heads rested on the decks. Directing the air and fuel charge to them was an Edelbrock Victor Jr. intake manifold topped off with an exceptional quick fuel black diamond 750 CFM carb. With 35 degrees of timing, the engine loaded the dyno and made a 4,000 to 6,800 RPM sweep and cranked out 507 horsepower, 447 pound-feet of torque. The parts for stage two will allow this engine to have a higher operating power band, a more stable valve train, and better breathing, and that's all a recipe for more power. And that includes a new set of Lenati valve springs, one of their big solid roller camshafts, a set of 10 degree tool steel retainers, and a set of machine keepers. For extra airflow, we're stepping up to an Edelbrock Super Victor intake manifold that's going to be topped off with a quick fuel Black Diamond 950 CFM carb. Now to let all that new incoming air escape is a set of inch and three quarters Hooker Super Comp headers. And last but not least, Cometic 27 thousandths thick MLS head gaskets will allow us to raise the compression over three quarters of a point. When all the parts for stage two arrived, it gave us an idea. We wanted to find out what the bigger carb and bigger headers would do on this combination. And we're doing it more for you, so you don't have to spend your hard-earned money trying to figure out if bigger is better, because sometimes it's not the case. These 1 and 5 8 headers did a great job with this combo, and just goes to show small primaries are not given enough credit. 1 and 3 quarter inch primary long tubes are going on and share the same size collector as the 1 and 5 8 these are Hooker Super Comps that fit a Fox Body Mustang. Nothing is changing except the primary size. Same length flow tubes and same size flex pipe is being used. The pull will be in the same RPM band as before from 4,000 to 6,800 RPM. So what is 125 thousandths or eighth inch of tube diameter worth? Holy <laughs> crap, 527. 451 foot pounds. How about that? It's a limitation. It's a limitation. It's a limitation. We've, uh, I think we've just proved that. 527, 451. Now our max was 507 before, so it picked up 20 numbers on power. On headers alone. Okay. All right, here's the big key for the engine builders watching. 1.52. I, 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 I can't believe that. 1.52 horsepower per cubes on this little 347. I cannot believe that out of pump gas. We're here. Yep. Before we tear this thing apart, mm -hmm. let's put that 950 on this thing with this bigger header. Yep. And just see. Just to see what it does. Yep. This will be an interesting test that can go either way. Now, swapping from a 750 to a 950 CFM carb is not just about being bigger. It's how the carb was set up initially for the application. That's nice. Might have snuck a little bit more into it. Oh, 532, yeah. <laughs> 452. Okay, well, that's uh, that's encouraging. So that right there shows us the headers were a restriction. A 950 carb isn't too big for this combination. Right. And we're stopping here and going to real stage we, two, we and we're going to make here. some yep. snot. Well, that's it for our test and tune on stage one. Now, in stage two, we are going to try and maximize the power potential for this engine, and that rests with a cylinder head. And what I mean by that is the cylinder head is capable of making over 600 horsepower due to its flow numbers. A rule of thumb is you can make two horsepower per CFM of airflow, and we're going to see how close we can come to that in stage two 
after the break. Next, another teardown to make way for some potent power adders. We're back, and Little Black and Blue is coming off the dyno for its stage two upgrade. We'll leave it on the dyno cart to do the actual swap out in the assembly area. We're tearing the engine all the way down to the short block so the carb comes off first along with the distributor. Now the Victor Junior manifold is removed. The scripted valve covers are next, followed by the rockers and push rods. With a little bicep grunt applied, we can remove the torqued ARP head bolt and lift the AFR heads off the deck, followed by the 41,000th thick head gaskets. Now the lifter spider, dog bones, and hydraulic lifters can be removed. Up front, our dyno pump can come off. Using a removal tool, the balancer is pulled off the crank snout. And underneath, we'll loosen the pan so we don't damage the pan gasket, removing the timing cover. And finally, the timing cover can reveal the billet timing set which also comes off. With the cam retaining plate removed, say goodbye to the hydraulic roller. Hydraulic rollers are great for low maintenance street strip engines, but if you're looking for valve train stability, higher RPMs, and more power, a solid roller like this is the way to go. Now there's more to it than just changing the camshaft. Everything associated with it also has to change, like springs, lifters, retainers, and locks. A solid roller lifter can follow an aggressive camshaft profile more accurately for a couple of different reasons. One, the solid assemblies are way lighter than the two hydraulics, even with the link bar attached at 263 grams, compared to the hydraulics, which are nine grams heavier, and that's huge in terms of valve train dynamics. There's no plunger actuation like there is on these hydraulics, and that actuation keeps the valve train quiet, but directly affects lift and duration. So using a solid roller will maintain accurate geometry throughout the entire RPM range, and that allows the engine to make power higher in the band due to its design. The cam is more aggressive across the board, but still within the range of our combination. It sports 249 degrees of duration on the intake and 255 degrees on the exhaust. We kept the lobe separation at 110, and as far as lift goes, we'll touch on that in a few. Keeping it in place is the same retaining plate torque to 110 inch-pounds. Here's a decision we have to make at this point. Where do we want this engine to make peak power with our stage two parts? The installed position of the cam's intake center line will dictate the engine's torque and horsepower peak numbers depending on the location relative to its lobe separation. So, retarding the cam will make peak power higher in the RPM range, while advancing the cam will make the peak lower in the range and also allow peak torque to happen sooner. We degree every cam and every engine that we build, and here's why. We're finding that the degree marks on the crank gear are not jiving with what we're finding. There are several variables that cause this, like the location of the dowel in the cam and the keyway in the crankshaft are just a couple. It's called stack tolerances, and it happens in every aspect of engine building. According to our numbers, we have to use the straight up keyway on the crank to position our cam at 105 and a half degrees of intake center line. Our lobe separation is 110 degrees, therefore the cam is installed 4.5 degrees advanced. That's the position that provided us optimal piston to valve clearance for this big cam. The timing cover goes back on now, followed by the timing pointer, which has to be set up again for true TDC. Then the balancer is pressed back on. Now it doesn't matter what timing pointer you're using, this is a step that has to be done to make sure that the marks on the balancer coincide with exactly where the number one piston is in the cylinder. Setting TDC with a piston stop like this ensures dwell is taken into effect. Dwell is the amount of time the piston is at TDC when the engine is running, and it is several degrees. It attaches to the deck and has a set screw that lets the piston stop solid against it. Now, we'll rotate the engine to bring the piston to the stop. The next step is to take a reading on the balancer. This shows 40 degrees before TDC. Now rotate the engine the opposite way and ease the piston up against the stop. Don't slam it. Now remember, we're counting the degrees after TDC, not the actual number you're seeing. It reads 320, which is 40 degrees after TDC. That verifies when the pointer is aligned with zero on the balancer, the number one piston is exactly at true top dead center. 
Coming up, Little Black and Blue gets ready for stage two. Little Black and Blue is in the middle of stage two, and the short block is wrapping up with these Lunati vertical bar solid lifters that are filling the lifter bores. They use a link bar to keep the roller in line with the cam lobe. Solid roller camshafts require more spring pressure to stabilize the valve train motion at higher RPMs. And that usually means a larger diameter valve spring. Here's a look at an old versus new Comparo. The hydraulic roller spring has an inch 280 diameter compared to the inch 550 diameter of the solid one. They're both dual springs. At our inch 800 installed height, the seat pressure on the old spring is 160 pounds, while on the solid roller spring, it's 227 pounds for a 67 pound increase. Now using the new components, we'll assemble the head. Now selecting these parts can be a little tricky, so a call into CompCam's tech line can be very helpful. For this stage, we're also raising the compression from 10.4 to 11.2, and all it's gonna take is a head gasket with a thinner compressed thickness. The old gaskets we tossed out were 041 thick, and this new MLS from Cometic is 27 thousandths thick. That's a reduction of 14 thousandths, which equals right at three cc's. So that's where the increase in compression comes from. The heads are ready to go back on now in their new configuration. ARP bolts are torqued to 65 foot-pounds. Here's where another parts change is happening. We're swapping out the conventional stud mount rockers for a shaft system like this. Now that's because we're going to turn this engine until it stops making power, which could be as high as 8,000 RPM. So we gave Jessel a call. The one-piece rocker shaft stand fastens to the original stud's locations, and they get torqued to 60 foot-pounds. These parts affected our pushrod length, so another measurement is needed. Now they're longer due to the stand's height. 6850 long is what we need. We also wanted the added hoop strength of a larger diameter pushrod because our open spring pressure is approaching 600 pounds. So these 3 8 ones will have less deflection than a 5 16 we ran before. Jessel sent these Sportsman Series shaft rockers that have several advantages over stud mount rockers, like reduced friction in all areas, corrects rocker geometry, and maintains last settings longer for less engine maintenance. Plus, the most important in our eyes is it stabilizes the valve train at any RPM due to their extensive engineering. We also increased the rocker arm ratio from 1.6 to 1.7 on the intake side for more lift. And the reason we put the cam in at 105 and a half degrees of intake center line is so we didn't run into any valve clearance issues. We just got our new Super Victor intake manifold back from John and Don at Baker Auto Machine in Franklin, Tennessee. Now they specialize in auto machining, hydraulic hose assemblies, and starter and alternator repairs. Now we sourced them to cut 60 thousandths off the intake flange so it matches up better with our AFR CNC ports. This also required them to cut 80 thousandths off the china rail so it doesn't bottom out on the block. Was it worth it? Yep. This is as good as you can get without port matching. The rest of the parts to get it back together are the same as you saw earlier when we made 532 horsepower. The moment we've been waiting on is here. It's dyno time. Just listen to this thing idle. It's got that super stock sound, and just like in stage one, we'll step the RPM sweep up as we progress to 8,000 RPM. When we're done, we'll show you how the big power pulls from both stages compare. Beginning at 30 degrees of timing, see what she does, and a sweep from 3,500 to 5,800 RPM. Now we're starting off on 93 octane pump gas just like before to see how far we can push the limits. Now we know it'll need better fuel once we get to a certain point, and we have that covered. 497 with 450 foot pounds. 457 was our stage one run, so yep. we're up 40 horsepower. I guess you want to compare that apples to Apples to apples. All That's right. pretty good, pretty good. All right, what I want to do, I'm going to go in there and check a plug because we're to the point now where octane is going to be an issue. So far, we're good. So we'll do another at 32 degrees. 497, 450. Yep. Repeated itself. But the plugs tell a different story. When you start to get a little speckle, just a tiny bit of speckle, it's called the black death, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when you start to increase your octane because um, 
as an oxidizer, it's, it's supposed to do air and fuel, not air, fuel, and aluminum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The higher the octane rating, the more resistance the fuel is to detonation. With the cylinder pressure we're generating, we've reached that limit. So we'll drain the fuel cell and lines to make way for some stouter gas. Normally at this point, we'd have to go spend big money on distilled racing fuel, but we found an alternative that costs way less and we trust it because we've used it before. It's called race gas and it's a race fuel concentrate that adds octane to pump gas. Now it'll go up to 105 depending on how you mix it. The formula is simple. If you want one gallon of 100 octane, mix four ounces of race gas with one gallon of 93 octane pump gas. Two ounces per gallon increases the octane four full numbers. We have three gallons of fuel, so 12 ounces are needed to make 100. Just remember, the more octane you put in doesn't mean you're gonna make more power. You need the minimum amount of octane to keep your engine away from detonation at your power level. Sometimes you can put too much octane in and it'll actually kill horsepower because it slows the burn rate of the fuel down. Let's leave the timing where it's at and take it to 6,500. I agree. No signs of detonation, and from the HP gauge on the console, it's gonna report a good number. 537, 454. Awesome. Now it's making some sneeze. Okay, good, 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 good. Our next step is to add two degrees of timing for a total of 34. All the reported numbers are peaks at the RPM we're taking the engine to at this point. 541, 456. Keep picking All up. Right, keeps picking up. So we'll leave it at 34 degrees, but push it from 45 to 7,000 RPM. 556, 455. <laughs> and it's still climbing it's hard. still climbing. Love it. Having an engine with great valve train and a solid bottom end allows us the confidence to bump the timing to 35 degrees and go for the gold. Here comes 8,000. <laughs> oh, baby. Five sixty six four fifty five. It holds it to eight thousand RPM. That holds the power. <laughs> nice. This is not bad for an engine that was originally designed to make uh, what two hundred twenty five horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're doing this on a stock block, off the shelf parts. And like you said, it, it's just a formula. That's all it is. It's a math equation and a formula of parts, and we nailed it. I believe so. Peak horsepower was at 7,200 RPM with this combination, while peak torque was at 5,800. Now this engine was still making 534 horsepower at 8,000. So just imagine what all this feels like going through the traps at the drag strip. And you can do just that if you follow this build. Although this wasn't a budget project, it does prove you can make big power without custom parts or any engine witchcraft. But we're approaching the limits of our block at this point, but not the internals. So for us, it was a hands down decision to do a stage three to this build. And let's just say that'll involve an aftermarket block and some forced induction. But before we go, take a look how the two stages compare. Stage one's package proves you can make great power with the hydraulic roller, but this type of valve train is limited by RPM. The solid roller made peak power higher in the RPM range, and it also carried that a lot farther for a higher RPM average. And here's what they look like overlaying each other. This potent setup goes to show you can't judge an engine by its valve covers.